Good morning once again. Good to have you all with us once again. And uh, uh, pretty small and intimate. It kind of reminds me of uh, a lot of the church services that uh, I was involved in before I came here at Irving. I came to Irving, I think, at that time, they were probably closer to 200 people as far as the church. I think now we're probably around 150 or something like that. And uh, this morning, I don't know, we might have 40 or 50. And that's kind of more what I'm familiar with. And, you know, maybe not such a big building as this, but around this size crowd anyway. So anyway, uh, but uh, anyway, um, this is probably just one of the three or four times in the, in the uh, calendar year that uh, I'll get to stand before you. And so uh, you may say, okay, well, now we see why. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, uh, for those of you who are um, uh, members of the GROW groups that, uh, that I lead, I'm going to lean pretty heavily on our uh, Hebrew uh, study. And so you'll be pretty familiar with that. And uh, if there's anything that I uh, seem to leave out or anything, just kind of raise your hand and shout it out to me because you'll probably already know it. So anyway, that's that. Uh, also, just wanted to mention the fact that, uh, of course, the, the reason that we are uh, a little smaller this weekend is because it is uh, Memorial Day weekend, and uh, so many of our church families going over to Farmerville uh, to, uh, to worship with them and the fellowship with the uh, group over there. So with that, I'm going to just kind of take some, uh, make some comments about Memorial Day and uh, it's not so much about the Memorial Day that we celebrate as a country, but also a very special time of memory that, uh, that we as Christians enjoy as well. So anyway, that's that. Uh, before I go into the lesson, uh, let's just take a moment. Let's pray, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for today and for bringing us to this time, dear Lord, where we get to study your word. And Lord, just pray, dear God, that you would just uh, use me this morning, God. We just pray that the, uh, the words that I speak, dear God, would uh, be beneficial, that it would be a blessing to someone here, Father, and dear God, that it would draw us closer to you, Lord. Uh, Father, we pray that these words would be your words, God, and that you would work through them in every way. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Okay. You know, I believe that for uh, most people, uh, probably really many of us, uh, Memorial Day has really uh, become like any other holiday that's on our calendar. Uh, we tend to largely get caught up in the, the food and the fireworks and the decorations. And oftentimes we forget the reason and the meaning that's behind the day. It's not just Memorial Day that's like that, but it's also Thanksgiving, it's Christmas, uh, Independence Day, and on down the list, uh, the meaning so often gets lost in the celebration. And so I'll just talk briefly about Memorial Day and this day that we celebrate on the last Monday of every May and where it comes from. Um, one of the first celebrations was held in 1865 in Charleston, South Carolina, where there was a ceremony to bury Union troops who had died in, the, in a Confederate prison camp. By the late 1860s, many Americans had begun hosting tributes to fallen Civil War soldiers, and the first nationwide observance was known as Decoration Day, and it occurred on May the 30th of 1868. Now, this traditional observance to honor fallen soldiers and decorate their graves continued throughout American history. It became a time to set aside, it came a time set aside to pray tribute to those who had fought and died in the wars in which Americans fought in, including World War I, World War II, the Korean conflict, and also Vietnam. Memorial Day was made an official federal holiday in 1971, and today we not only pay tribute to fallen soldiers, but it's also become a day for us to remember and think about any loved one that has passed on before us. And that's really what a memorial is. It's anything, whether it's a time, a celebration, or a ritual that's intended to preserve the memory of a person or a significant event. And so we see uh, some examples of memorials scattered throughout Scripture. For instance, we read one this morning in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 14. 
where uh, uh, God told Israel that this day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. And so we recognize this passage as being the institution of the Passover celebration for the children of Israel. And the significance of that is it was the day in which the Lord showed up and delivered the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage through the last of ten plagues. And then also we read in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 23 through 25, the Bible says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. Now, this one was known as the Feast of Trumpets. And what this was, was it was a time set aside to celebrate uh, uh, for the children of Israel to commemorate God's appearance uh, on Mount Sinai when he gave Moses the law. And so you see, the Israelites, when we think back, they didn't have cameras or video or television or anything like that that they could go back and watch and remember these special times. But God gave them these special days and times and rituals to help them remember and to commemorate how he had worked in their lives and how he had shown up for them. And so now I just really want to talk about another very special memorial day or time that we find mentioned in Hebrews chapter 10. But first, before I do, I want to give just a little bit of background information about the letter that's going to help us maybe to understand the passage just a little bit more. This letter, the Hebrew letter, was written to Hebrews, that is, Israelites, who had begun to follow Jesus. Now, sometime after their conversion to Christ, they had come under persecution. And because of this persecution, many of them were now tempted to lead Jesus and maybe perhaps go back to the law of Moses. And so the writer of Hebrews wants to accomplish three things through this letter. Uh, first of all, uh, he wants to teach or instruct these Christians that Jesus and the new covenant that he ushered in is far superior to the old covenant system and everything that came with it, including Moses, the priest, the animal sacrifices, and everything that came under the law, Jesus was superior as well as the new covenant that he ushered in. Well, secondly, the writer wants to warn these Israelite believers that it's foolish for them to leave Jesus. And when he issues these warnings, I want you to understand that he pulls no punches. Leaving Jesus, whether through disobedience or through unbelief, bears eternal consequences. And he wants them to know and understand this. When thirdly, the Hebrew writer wants to encourage these believers by letting them know and understand that despite whatever they're going through, Jesus is worth it and Jesus will help guide them through it and help see them through on the other side of whatever struggles they're dealing with. Now, we see all three of these approaches used in chapter 10. I want you to notice uh, in Hebrews chapter 10, especially verses 11 through 14, where he says, and every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should make a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. You know, in that passage, this passage, we could say a passage of, a, of instruction, the writer is teaching us that Jesus' sacrifice of his own body and blood is better than the sacrifices offered by the priests under the Old Covenant. The Bible tells us here that Jesus, by a single offering, has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. In other words, where those Old Testament priests had to go continually and offer sacrifices, Jesus offered one sacrifice, and by that one sacrifice, 
we are cleansed continually for our sins. Well, then notice in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 and 29, here the Hebrew writer offers a warning. He says, for if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, sanctified and outraged the spirit of grace? And once again, remember I said that when the Hebrew writer uh, issues these warnings, he pulls no punches. This was a stern warning to them and to us not to turn our backs on Jesus through continual sin and disobedience. And so once again, the Hebrew writer is warning these Hebrew Christians, he's warning us as well, that it is foolish to leave Jesus. But now I want to notice his encouragement that we read in verses 32 through 33. There are other encouragements that he re find, we find in this chapter, but I want to notice verses 32 and 33. The Hebrew writer here says, but recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. Now, in reading that, uh, it certainly doesn't sound very encouraging uh, because the writer calls for them to remember uh, when you endured a hard struggle with suffering and remember when you were publicly exposed to reproach and affliction. Of course, that's, that's not very encouraging at all. But I really want to focus on that first statement that he made in that passage. He said, remember the former days when you were first enlightened. In other words, he is saying, remember the days when you first came to know Jesus Christ. Remember when you first heard the message of the gospel. Remember when you were baptized into Jesus Christ. Remember when you first realized that the Spirit of God actually dwelled in you and was with you. I submit to you that the writer is talking about a time that is truly worth remembering. It is a time worth memorializing. The time when you first were enlightened by the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Notice in Hebrews chapter 10, 34 and 35, he says, For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, he says, which has a great reward. The writer emphasizes that with Jesus comes a, a better abiding possession, and a great reward. That great reward is eternal life in Jesus Christ. And the abiding possession is a place in heaven, a place in God's new creation. It is an abiding possession, something that cannot be taken away, something that will not fade away, something that nobody can take from you. Beloved, following Jesus may very well sometimes come with loss and struggle, but Jesus promises that the rewards are great. Notice what he says or what he told his disciples in Matthew chapter 19, verses 27 through 29. It says, then Peter said in reply, see, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Well, Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. In that passage, Jesus is saying that whatever you've left behind or whatever you've lost to follow him, he restores 100-fold plus he grants eternal life. You know, one of the things that we talked about, or one of the things that kind of came out of our grow group study was the fact that 
you know how many times when a person first decides to follow Jesus, there's that initial wave of joy and excitement, enthusiasm. You know, we want to tell everybody, um, uh, we want to change the world. You know, uh, I can remember when I, shortly after I was baptized and I started studying the Bible and I was just so excited and enthused and I, uh, I had an uncle who was, a, uh, who was a prominent Baptist preacher and I remember saying, man, I've got, to, I've got to go and straighten him out, got to go get him right. And so, you know, I, I called him, I said, I want to, uncle, I want to come and talk to you. And so I gathered up all my notes and my Bible and all that stuff and I went over and and spent a good deal of time just talking to him and, and, and studying the Bible with him. I was excited. I remember before the time that I, uh, I gave my very first lesson, I thought, you know, man, I've got something these people need to hear. And so I sent out uh, uh, a bunch of postcards to all of my relatives, letting them know that I'm, I'm preaching on Sunday night, I'm giving my first sermon, and you need to be here. You need to come and hear this. I was excited. I was enthused, and that's how it is sometimes when we first come to Jesus Christ. We have that initial wave of excitement and enthusiasm. But you know, maybe just like those Christians in Hebrews, so oftentimes hard times come. We might run into hardship. We might start to lose some friends. Maybe some storms come into our life and things like that. Or maybe we just kind of lose a little bit of that energy. And so many times, like these brothers and sisters in Hebrews, we can be tempted to leave Jesus because it gets hard or because we can't always see where this life of following Jesus is taking us. But maybe, just like those Christians in Hebrews, we need to have a Memorial Day. We need to have a Memorial Day. We just need to remember the days when we were first enlightened, as he says, and recapture that initial joy and enthusiasm that maybe can help us through those rough patches in our Christian walk. Understanding that in spite of the struggle, there's a promise of a better abiding possession and a great reward for those who remain faithful to Jesus. Consider what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3. It's a familiar passage to us. He says, but whatever gain I had, he said, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings being coming like him in his death. You know, when we think about the Apostle Paul, you know, before coming to Jesus, Paul was a somebody in the Jewish world. He had education, he had status, And Paul was probably fairly well off. But coming to know Jesus and following him cost Paul everything. But he said, I count it all as rubbish when compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ. That's a big statement. He said, I count it all as rubbish. In other words, it means nothing compared to what he's gained in knowing Jesus Christ. You see, brothers and sisters, when we come to know Jesus and walk with him, everything that we might give up or anything that we may lose, whatever we may suffer, all of the struggle is worth it because just like the Hebrew writer points out over and over again, Jesus is better. What he offers in return is better. And the person that we become in him is better. And so maybe we should all individually from time to time celebrate a Memorial Day, remembering the time when we were first enlightened, when we first came to know Jesus, and recapture that joy and that enthusiasm that comes from knowing 
that he has saved us and that he loves us even more than we comprehend And the life and the rewards that he has in store for us are richer than we can know. Whether you're going through some struggle or maybe you've simply lost some of that early joy, let's do what the Hebrew writer encouraged his readers to do. Recall the former days when you were first in light. I'll give you that lesson. I'll leave it with you. Amen.